took the host status away from myself. So that we'll have to deal with that with our next webinar. So tell me when we're recording. It's recording. Oh, uh, we're recording. Great. Good evening, everybody. Uh, good evening from Jerusalem, that is. This is Jonathan Feldstein. I'm Jonathan Feldstein. And really thrilled that you're here. And as people continue to, to join tonight, those of you who are watching this live uh, know that there's been a technical problem. Those of you watching this afterward, doesn't really matter. You're going to enjoy the full program. Um, uh, I have the privilege of being the president and CEO of the Genesis 123 Foundation. And we have a really special mission, which is to build bridges between Jews and Christians and Christians with Israel in ways that are new and unique and meaningful. We have a number of programs. I invite you to visit our website, genesis123.co, to learn about some of the ways we're doing this uh, toward the end of the program. I'm gonna, we're gonna give a shout out for one of them in particular. Um, but one of the things that we're, that we're doing that's unique is, is um, building bridges. Our board is a, is a lovely diverse group of Jews and Christians from, from truly all over the world. And we're thrilled about that. And we are building bridges from a position of respect, but, with, with, but acknowledging our respective traditions. We're not trying to change anybody. We really just want to underscore the things that build, that, that, that unite us and in and, and which we share a common foundation as Jews and Christians. And foremost among them, of course, is the God of Israel, the people of Israel, the land of Israel, and the state of Israel. And all of those are very significant and all of those are coming into, into play and conversation as we, uh, as we begin this. Now, uh, those of you who are on very early and heard our conversation about the inability to share this on Facebook, if you're watching this and wish to share on social media now, um, please do so because we're having an, uh, a hard time doing that. Um, I wanna thank our, our sponsor. It's lovely to have sponsors and I invite people to come along with us and join uh, as sponsors. Um, sometimes they want recognition and sometimes they don't and not to get into a whole conversation about the various levels of charity according to the Rambam, but it's lovely to have people, um, albeit that this has nothing to do with making people self-sufficient, we appreciate the anonymity and, the, and the, um, the fact that some people just want to support really important programs and don't care about their uh, name or, or getting credit. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, we're really thrilled that you're here. We're gonna ask everybody to use the Q&A section um, in the Zoom chat here for um, questions that you have along the way. We're gonna have a formal question and answer session at the end of uh, a bit of this conversation after we get a bunch of uh, main topics out of the way. But, uh, but as, as we see uh, questions coming up, if we can fit them in, we're, we're really gonna be pleased to do so. Um, again, you, you'll get more information at the Genesis 123 Foundation, genesis123.co. Now, normally I actually avoid reading introductions, um, but today I have a very deliberate reason. It's not for, for my lack of being imprecise, which I am freely admit that I do that lots of times, um, but actually in preparing the introductions of our two guests today, I specifically wanted, I, I, I specifically came across language that was really important for me to highlight. And so I want to read it. Um, in alphabetical order, we are completely thrilled to have Alana Heidemann smiling back at us uh, from not far away in, uh, in, 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 in the Judean mountains as well. Um, Ilana is, is truly dynamic and passionate. Actually, we've never met in person, I believe. Um, she's a dynamic and passionate educator who works creatively and collaboratively to create a stronger voice for future Jewish leadership. Now, I love the words creative and collaborative because that underscores what we're doing. We're doing things that are unique and out of the box. She's a respected lecturer and educational consultant with a commitment to incorporating understanding of respect for the Jewish history and the Jewish people. Through her involvement with numerous programs, um, Alana is continually seeking to facilitate a dialogue and build bridges. These are her own words. This is, we're, not, we're not just getting people out of the blue. We took this straight off the website. Um, and, and, uh, and, and so it really speaks to our heart and to what we're, and what we're doing with the Genesis 123 Foundation. Um, as a historian, you're actively connecting people with the, from our past with the present and future. And that's one of the reasons we invited you to be part of this dialogue tonight. Um, you, you're the executive director of the Israel 
Forever Foundation, which engages people in enlightening, experiential, and apolitical uh, ways of engagement and act uh, to enhance um, connections with Israel. Again, in a meaningful way, your language, and that, and I love that we're able to have that same uh, kind of orientation. Um, one of the things that I uh, now I'm going kind of off script, but one of the things that I really like about our interaction over however long a period of time we've been interacting by email and social media is that you and uh, and the Israel Forever Foundation are not engaging people from a half full perspective, you're engaging people from an overflowing cup perspective. And I really like that. And, and I, as I was thinking about, about what I wanna say, uh, some of the people following this know that I do a great deal of writing. Um, every, every time I write something, you're on my distribution list. And most of the time you're not publicizing, putting my articles up on your, on your website because they're not relevant and they don't, and they're, they, they're very political or too political. So it's real great affirmation for me, the times that you actually choose to post my articles because it means that I've reached a higher level of being beyond the political and trying to do something that suit that is actually suiting your, uh, your mission. So we're really, really thrilled to have you with us tonight, Alana. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, Danny Seaman um, is an Israeli media expert, former civil servant, journalist, and currently the managing director for the of the movement of governability for, uh, for the movement for governability and democracy, he has a three decade long career in Israeli civil service, um, serving under six different prime ministers, um, uh, uh, including some of the positions the, uh, as director of the government man, uh, director of the government press office, deputy director general uh, for information at the Israel Ministry of Public Diplomacy and Diaspora Affairs. Um, and after his military service, I actually never asked you about this, but now that I have a son who's a paratrooper, um, I know you served in an elite paratrooper unit as well. Uh, we can say an extra little prayer for my son who's down in Hebron this week, um, actually now for the next couple of months, um, and also served at the Israeli consulate in New York. Now, Danny and I go back to that, to that point, and that's where, I, again, coming off, uh, off script for a minute, uh, my first job out of college was serving as information officer at the Israeli consulate in Atlanta back in the late 80s. And Danny was in New York at the time, and I don't recall precisely what the position was, but I remember we had the privilege of interacting a lot. I remember um, your intellect, fun, cr creative. We, we were, we were at, if, you, if we remember the time, it was during what was the original intifada, right? Israel was getting beaten up, and that's a uh, pun intended, but we were getting beaten up in the media, and you and I and a number of other people on staff had the had the responsibility for spinning what was going on uh, in a pre-social media uh, direction. I always enjoyed those interactions. I remember your creativity and intelligence fondly, and so I'm really glad, Danny, that you're here um, with us as well. Um, you should both unmute yourselves because I'm going to give a little bit of background and then go into some questions. And again, uh, just to underscore, um, Virginia, you got your hands on people who are joining <clears throat> and we do want your questions um, by the Q&A section. So we're in the month of November and, and I don't know, honestly, I can't do a study um, whether November is in fact a more significant month um, in, the, in the history of, of modern Israel, but it's always struck me how significant November is. Um, there are a few events that have taken place in our history um, over the last century plus that I consider major milestones, uh, and, and then ones that are no less significant, but, um, but, but perhaps not with quite the global impact. Um, that's my perspective, and I hope that in the course of this conversation, you'll agree, disagree, um, and, and give your own uh, thoughts and input. But just to kind of frame the conversation, um, looking back, and Alana also, as, you, uh, as your bio cor so correctly states, framing the past, but in the context of the present and looking toward the future. The three main milestone events that I am looking at in November, the bookends, the November 2nd and November 29th of the Balfour Declaration and the United Nations partition vote. Um, and, then, uh, and then in 1977, President Sadat's visit to Jerusalem. Um, which is even more significant, I think, maybe this was significant last month, but it's significant this month and even this week with the Bahraini foreign minister. Um, each of those in one way or another, I think, and I love your thoughts on this, were elements of the realization of the early Zionist vision that Israel should become and be accepted 
as a nation like every other nation. Um, and, and on that level, that's why I'm di di kind of differentiating them from, uh, from, from other no less significant, but perhaps less global um, milestone events. Um, they also, as I was looking at this, I don't know that it's not rocket science to figure it out, but it's coincidental that all of those three events, uh, those three events happened exactly 30 years apart, 1917, 1947, and 1977. Um, and so, uh, it, what, except possibly, I love your thoughts on this, with the, probably the euphoria of Balfour, in 1917, I wonder if anyone really felt that 30 years later that they would be that we would be at those respective levels. That in fact we would have a state just short shortly after 30 years, or if that was still a distant dream. And and and, and from and from statehood that in fact 30 years later, and maybe that's way too long that we'd have peace with our largest. Um, Arab neighbor. Uh, and before getting into letting you two speak, just to frame then a couple of other, well, I don't want to diminish the significance, but the, the relatively minor events uh, that were in November. Um, Alana, you and I spoke about this offline a couple of weeks ago, Rabin's assassination in 1995, um, the United Nations vote to declare Zionism as racism in 1975, and this week, the anniversary of Operation Moses, the, the initial rescue of Ethiopian, uh, the beginning of the, the, the rescue and, and return home of the Jewish community in Ethiopia. So, so with all of that said, um, what I wanted to, to ask you uh, is, is what, uh, what do you think of these events? What are the significant uh, significance to you um, a, in general and how they built upon one another? And, and for the moment, not only ladies first alphabetical, Lana, do you want to jump in and, and give any comments? Sure. I think that it's important to not only take it forward how each of these events happened 30 years after each other, but also what was happening 30 years beforehand. Um, so whether or not, you know, we could, it is 30 years this small time period as we think it is, is it a long time period? Um, I think that we have to remember that Herzl himself writes in his, in his diary after the first Zionist Congress in 1897, and he writes, today I have created the Jewish state. It may not come to, come to fruition, or come into existence mm -hmm. tomorrow. It may not come for five years, for 50 years. But it will be, and interestingly enough, it was nearly 50 years exactly that it took before the right. state was created. So I think that we also have to look at some of the trends that take place within societies that inevitably maybe are a cycle that around 30 years, a few decades, what's happening in the society, what's the role of Jews in the society, what's the role of freedom of Jews in that society? Um, and how does that interplay with the way Jewish aspirations for self-determination of our rights, just as human beings, start there? And only after that do people then see their ability to accept uh, Zionism as not just the political entity that it's come to be known, but actually as the fulfillment of that Jewish destiny. Um, so I think that 30 years is really a short time period. And when you look at the work done within the, each of those phases, the leadership that was required to really finagle their way to get into all the different avenues in order to make each of those things happen. Maybe we are a little, um, you know, we live in a generation of immediate gratification. 30 years seems like a really long time. And we forget that the typical wars were 100 years wars. We forget that, you know, even when we look at the biblical existence in the kingdom of Israel, how many years did it exist? So maybe a little bit, we want to reassess the significance of this round number and instead think, what are the phases? because it's those phases that actually repeat themselves in each generation and I think go very much hand in hand with the rise of anti-Semitism also in societies. I think they really work together. Uh, Balfour didn't come out of an abyss either. The fact that Chaim Weizmann had met with Balfour years earlier, a decade earlier, and already the discussion on the table was of the Jewish return to the ancestral homeland. So what we see is that, what I believe we see is that 
Um, it took all those, it took each next decade. Okay, well, we'll, we'll, we'll accept Jewish rights a little bit more. We'll accept the Jewish dream and the legitimacy of it a little bit more. And as you see, even with the visit of Sadat and onward, we see that happening more and more. Okay, we'll accept a little bit more, but what happens in each time within that, those, distinct, the, those distinctive uh, historical events is a really deep downfall. So right after 1917, when, when the Balfour Declaration is made, first of all, right before it, you have massive pogroms, uh, government-sponsored riots against Jews. But then you also have, you know, a decade afterwards, both in uh, the diaspora around Europe, but also in the land of Israel. So I think that there is a pattern, a pattern that we can see. Can we predict it? Maybe not. And can mm. we create direct parallels, as many people are trying to create today, and saying, oh, it's just the same as Nazi Germany or whatever it is? No. But but the upheavals of recognition of Jewish suffering, recognition of Jewish rights, then again Jewish suffering, then again those those different recognitions play a pattern. Because as I mentioned to you, Jonathan, I think you cannot separate from you jump to the UN vote of that that second end bookend, right? And you jump to it, but uh, the 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 UN vote for the partition could not have happened had it not been for the events taking place on the Exodus and the, the survivors of the Holocaust who had made their way on the Exodus on July 17th, 1947, they make their way to Haifa and they're boarded by the British, the same British who had, you know, yay, yay, Balfour Declaration. You know, we have to remember, we can't put all of our, all of our faith in these declarations. They don't give us any rights. They are simply a reaffirmation of those rights. But interestingly enough, to reach the partition plan vote, you did you need to have a Holocaust? No. But there was suddenly, through the story of the Exodus, which finally was reaching newspapers all over the world and cries coming out, actually, it's another milestone of November, is in the early days of November, you have Jews who, after being returned to Germany, were actually put back in camps. So there were Jews who survived Mauthausen to then be sent back to Mauthausen because they were sent away from Israel by the British, by the, from the land of Israel by the British. I mean, the irony is uncanny, but what it did was this outcry awoke, I don't wanna call it world pity because too many people call it world pity for the Jew, but it woke an awareness of, wait a second, here are Jews and they have rights just like anybody else that it isn't the pity, it is a recognition of the human existence of the Jew. So I think that for I, when I look at those phases of each of the 30 years, it's who is recognizing it, at what time, what are the social and political situations, even economic, but we'll leave that to the side, what are the, what are the circumstances in the background? Because uh, a lot of human history goes through these cycles of every few decades. Anti-Semitism in is one of them. Uh, appreciation of Jewish rights is another. And of course, denigration of Jewish rights, which is a, a pathway to the anti-Semitism, comes hand in hand. So they really feed in, and we might start, we might still see you ask about the future. I think that there's there's an element of that that we have to be a little bit realistic of how long how long it takes to create peace in well, people's hearts. Let, that was amazing. Let's get to the future in the future a little bit. Um, that was awesome. Danny, I know you, you're probably wanting to jump in, but I have to, before you do, um, Alana, I just want to jump back. I love how you um, kind of unpack those 30 year segments. So just, it, it's coincidental and that happens to be November, but let, let me let's rewind a bit and maybe it's nothing to do with November, but was what was there a what, was there a thirty years uh, event or 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 series of events in your mind that took place before Balfour? Uh, oh yeah, it, absolutely. Well, well, what's thirty years before Balfour? Is the onset? Uh, first of all, the Dreyfus trial is just within that span of time, which then leads Herzl to wake up. And no Got matter it. what people think, he was not an unaffiliated Jew. His grandfather was a rabbi. I mean, you know, there, he was as assimilated as most American Jews today, for example. Um, so yeah, you have a 30-year buildup. Buildup. How do we make? 
uh, look at how Israel's development, we are now the startup nation, we're an innovation nation, right? But if you look at the first 30 years of the existence of the state, it's a very it's a different kind of innovation, agricultural innovation, mm. uh, peace innovation, of course, war innovation. Um, you, you, we don't stop. It's part of, you know, you, I could do, by the way, I can also do the 30 years uh, in, in medieval times because there, but it, was my, it wasn't 30 years. They were spans of like 70 years. Again, showing how human and the human condition, human history changes so much. Um, and, and our behaviors go along with it and the historical events, you know, coincide. So I do awesome. definitely think that pre Balfour, you absolutely have that uh, change as well. So just for as a historic note for people who are watching Dreyfus was Alfred Dreyfus, who was a uh, yes. friend. That's okay. It's okay. Uh, a French officer, a Jewish officer, um, who was, uh, who was, uh, tried and convicted of treason. Yes. And uh, and and found guilty and dishonorably um, demoted and deranked and sent to prison and uh, and and it was Herzl Theodor Herzl who as you correctly noted covered that as a journalist so that thank you for that great perspective we'll 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 rewind thirty years before Dreyfus at another time Danny what what there's a lot to unpack today as I mentioned in our emails this is a com complicated conversation because it's not a linear subject. We're taught, we, we, and, I, and I picked November kind of random, but uh, y, 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 maybe just your thoughts. I mean, I, I don't even, there's a lot to talk about here. Well, Ilana gave me a lot to think about, to be honest. <laughs> um, she put it in a very interesting perspective. So maybe I'll, I'll take it to a different direction. Um, recently, I've been following on my family who came here. I'm obviously from my English, you know that I came from the United States. But interestingly enough, my family came here from Afghanistan about 100 years ago. And it does tie into the Balfour Declaration because while the Zionist movement itself, the political movement, was from Europe and part of this whole uh, nationalist movement going on throughout Europe in the uh, 19th century, and Herzl is just an extension of that, understanding that Jews also have a national identity uh, that should be picked up and, and followed through with. Um, but that was the political aspect of it. For many Jews, and a, and a large majority of the Middle Eastern Jews, uh, Jews who lived in, in uh, Iraq and um, Iran, Afghanistan, or what we call the Babylonian, those who came from the Babylonian um, uh, expulsion from the land of Israel, my family never came back. Uh, during the time of Ezra and Nehemiah, they remained in Babylonia, uh, then Persia and Iran. They eventually, when, with the rise of Islam, they moved to Afghanistan. We can trace our, our family tree. So, the Jews in North Africa, in, in Asia, preserved um, their identity and the belief and, and the promise of the prophets that one day we are to return. And this promise of the prophets of God's promise to the Jewish people. This was not something in a book for them. This was not something that they studied in history. This was a living promise that they all believed. And just recently I found um, uh, the eulogy for my grandfather who passed away. He was the head of the Afghan community. And they spoke about how he, about over 100 years ago, um, when the rumor was spread, and it's amazing how among the Jews the, the, the messages spread very quickly, that they were saying that out of Europe there is this return to the land of Israel. They didn't call it Zionism there, they call it the redemption is occurring. And so my family, they came here around the time of the Balfour Declaration to see if this is indeed true. Wow. It took them over a year to go from Afghanistan to the land of Israel through Saudi Arabia and through Egypt. And they came and they saw us through, they went back, packed up their family and came and exactly in, in um, 1920, they arrived in Jerusalem, purchased land and lived in Jerusalem. And um, he, he lived on the outskirts, what was the outskirts of Jerusalem. We know that it's in the middle in, in Shkunata Bukharim, <laughs> the Bukharian, which is in the middle of Jerusalem today. Then it was the outskirts and they said to him, you know, how can you live there? There's the danger. They didn't call them uh, uh, terrorists then. They called them the uh, marauders, uh, the uh, fadain. Uh, you know, how can you? He said, "We're now restoring and redeeming the land of Israel. God will protect us." So they had this strong belief that this is something that God promised. It's happening again. It doesn't matter if they call it Zionism or not. They all packed up. This was part of a Jewish belief to return here. So they came immediately, built their home in in Jerusalem. At the beginning in 
they first started in the old city because that's what they, they knew. But the moment the Jews left the old city, they moved out of there as well and started expanding here in the land of Israel. So this was something that Jews, not only for Europe, but Jews from North Africa and Asia who came here partook in and were part of this Zionist dream. And when people talk about Zionism, where you mentioned the fact that this was the also the anniversary in November of the Zionism is racism, you know, to, to, to define the Jewish desire of, of self-determination as being a form of racism is not only ridiculous, it goes against everything that us in the, the Judeo-Christian Western society believed in for, for thousands of years. And suddenly now in the, in the 20th century, these geniuses are trying to change everything that, that brought us to where we are at this point, positively and negatively, but mostly positively, the Western society based on these values of Judeo-Christian values has made enormous achievements. And not only in our lifetimes, but throughout history, this is the, the shining light of, of, the, the, of history has been the 20th century or the second part of the 20th century after World War II. But even World War II was fighting for what we believe to be right. And the United States being the flagship of Western society, being the, the power behind the goodness of Western society, uh, one reason Israel is such a strong ally of the United States is precisely that. We share these values. And so based on these values, we created the state of Israel to offer a home. And you mentioned also the, the return of, of the Ethiopian Jewry, who were disconnected for Judaism since the time of Solomon. And here, and I had the, the, the fortune, I was fortunate enough when I first started working in the prime minister's office, being part of this uh, in 1991, uh, when, the, when you had the operation. And, and it was something, it, it, till this day, it, it, it astounds me to, to remember and seeing them coming here to Israel and, and leaving. It, it, it's, it's unbelievable. You can see the generations of Jews and these people coming out with their Ethiopian, uh, you know, it's amazing today, they're, they're Israeli to, to every degree, the, at least the children and grandchildren of these who arrived from Ethiopia, uh, what is it, 30 years ago as well, um, who arrived here. Yeah, you have that 30 years. And within 30 years, their grandchildren are already very much part of our society with the difficulties, but nothing is, nothing is perfect. There are always going to be difficulties. But the ability of this society to absorb and to be the multi, you know, everybody's talking about multiracial and multinationalism and multiculturalism, everybody's talking about, this exists in the state of Israel. What, if we're anything, we're multiculturalists. And that's the success and the amazing achievement of the state of Israel. And all this happened because of these people sharing a dream, sharing a desire, sharing a belief. God made a promise. He's living up to that promise now. We're fortunate enough to, to live that dream. And every day I look at it, I look at my four children, and I look at this. I say, we're living the dream that our grandparents, our great-grandparents, our great-great-grandparents could only dream about and could yeah. never believe. And, and, and for us, and we should never take this for granted. And that's the amazing achievement of it. Um, you know, what is 70 years or 80 years uh, in a history of 2000 years? And, and we're very fortunate to be here. So that's how I look at this, being the realization of things that we were promised and dreamt about and took this as being a doctrine that someday will come true and it has. Thank you. I love how you also, how you framed that and, and, and brought in your, your own family's uh, uh, perspective and history and the faith, which also, when we fast forward to the Ethiopians, um, e even before 1991, the, the, the anniversary this week is uh, of, uh, of Operation Moses, the original. Um, and, and remember that, that, that Jews walk weeks uh, across the, the uh, across horrible terrain with smugglers who took advantage in many many different ways, and they and it was all based on faith, and it, it was bringing the same um, level of faith, uh, and, and also just on a on a total personal note that's nothing to do with November per se, um, but but uh, my youngest son, we have six, and my youngest son was the only one of them who's been uh, of my kids born in Jerusalem, and I've always been amazed how he didn't do anything, he just arrived. And he's named for two of my relatives, uh, my father's, my father's grandfather and my father's cousin, who were both murdered in the Holocaust. And my and and certainly my my father's grandfather, but even my father's cousin was old enough at that time to be praying for Israel and and Jerusalem uh, Jerusalem specifically. And now a little boy who's not so little anymore. It's just 
born here and carries their name. It's a, it's an incredible miracle. Um, let, let, let me let me come back to November at the risk of going off script or on script. Um, Danny, Alana mentioned some really great trends within the, the, the 30 years is coincidental, but it's a good framework. Um, is there anything that you would add or, or contribute as far as what changed in between, uh, and we'll go even back further, Dreyfus, uh, uh, Balfour, um, partition, and then Sadat, anything that, that was a unique historical point or, or, or pivoting that allowed for, for, for the next to occur? Well, it, it takes time to make tremendous changes. And this was a tremendous change in the Jewish identity and the Jewish, um, what we've been accustomed to for 2000 years and certainly the creation of the state. And the state just doesn't happen, you know, well, we created a state, well, at least for us, it didn't happen this way. Let's have a party and, uh, and Eastern European countries perhaps felt that way after the fall of the Berlin Wall and the fall of communism. Um, but for us, it was a whole different story. It was nothing was taken for granted. Um, the European countries, I believe to some degree felt guilty about the Holocaust and made us an offer that they hoped that we would refuse. And the partition plan itself was only a part of what the, um, had been promised and it was not promised, you know, the British didn't do us any, uh, any favors. They followed in what they believed to be also part of the Christian belief also, the Jews have a right and will return to the land of Israel one day. Okay. The land of Israel was not where you have today the green line and all this nonsense and what they're, they're preaching to us as being the international law, which no such concept actually exists. So we have to deal with the international community. And I was saying the Europeans, felt guilty, they gave us this thing saying, you know, there's no way they're going to accept this because it's only a part of what they were, and wasn't even, we didn't even have Jerusalem included in it. And the Jews accepted it because Ben Gurion was smart enough to know that it's either now or never and we have to take it. And we'll start with that and see what happens. Um, they, nobody came to our aid. There was, except for, for, the, for Czechoslovakia, nobody came to assist us. We were all on our own and on our own abilities. And the, uh, Ben Gurion and Golda Meir and, and all the great leaders that we had at that time. I'm putting aside all the political differences right now because it doesn't matter. We were all in this together and we would have fallen together as well. And perhaps it is a miracle or perhaps it's a, a testimony to the stubbornness of the human spirit when you believe in something. And after everything we went through, it was not only the Holocaust. The Holocaust was just a culmination of it in a short period of time because there were uh, um, persecutions against Jews everywhere. and and generations of Jewish people who went through personal Holocaust. They lost family, they saw their family, even in the land of Israel in, in 1929 and in 1921, there were persecutions against Jews here and pogroms against Jews here. And, and you can't tell me that a family that, that saw their children who saw their parents murdered, uh, their mothers and sisters raped, uh, and the horrible things that were done to them, don't go through the same thing that people in the Holocaust, not to diminish the Holocaust in any yes. way, but for the personal people that went through these things. So every Jew carries that. Uh, I know that though my family had not gone through the Holocaust, when I went to Auschwitz, I felt that I had been there before. It's an amazing feeling, uh, not a good feeling. I'm saying that this, this it's, some, it's, a, it's a place that I felt that I had been there. Maybe it's the education we get. I don't know what it was, but I could feel that I had been at that location. It's a strange feeling. So we had that and we carry that in our DNA. So we knew we had no other choice. So you create that state and we were successful, but now, all right, we have to start doing something and absorbing over a million Jews within a period of five years from, from North Africa and Asian countries and from Europe and from all over the world. And how do you start? We had no economy, we had no natural resources. The only natural resources we had were our own capabilities. So it takes time to develop that. I remember when my family came here, my mother had met my father was an American GI in Germany. She went to visit her relatives. Her sister was married to a German Jew. She went to marry there, met my father, married and went through a 20 year cycle. And eventually we moved to the state of Israel in 1971. Israel was a third world country, especially for an American. When you see it in 1971, it was horrendous. And also a socialist country at that, which is even worse. So <laughs> I see how Israel developed over the years where I think today, we, are, we compete with every country in the world. We're leading in many other areas. And I think this is an interesting thing. And I wanna tie this in with what's happening with the Abraham Accords, because there is something that connects Jews and Muslims and Arabs in the Middle East. And for many years, Muslim leaders here throughout the Middle East knew how to rely on 
the abilities that Jews brought to their communities and to their nations. And Jews were advisors uh, from the Rambam to others and, and, and assisted them. And for political reasons, there was this separation of the Jews and the Muslims because they did not have a problem with the Jews returning. And so you take what is happening today, and I give a lot of credit to President Trump for not falling into the same uh, types of, of, of thinking that has tied our hands and kept us back from having a true peace, even with Egypt in the past uh, 40 years. Um, now these things are, are, are opening up and allowing us to go back for the Arabs understanding how beneficial a Jewish state here is for them and for their ability to reach out to the world. So the promise we have right now is, is astounding. Not only the promise that our forefathers and foremothers had uh, 72, 73 years ago, 80 years ago in, in creating the state, we also have these things that there's still a lot of work to be done, uh, still a lot of things that can be done and um, we're, we're developing. And, and even now it's gonna take a while with the-, with the 30 uh, years. With the, no, I, I, it'll take, it'll be much quicker right now. But if you remember with Egypt, it was, a, it was the leadership and not so much the people. Now you're seeing connection between That's Arab great. people and they're interested and they're curious and they're uh, impressed with what we've done here and they wanna share with that and they want to have this unity with us. So the, the future of the state of Israel in the Middle East is, is even more amazing than it was over great. the past 2000 years. Thank you. Alana, there's a lot to respond and I want you to. Um, w w there's a lot to respond, but I'm realizing, and I neglected this in a couple of ways. A, I don't think I mentioned your PhDs in Holocaust uh, studies, and 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 you had the privilege of learning with Ellie Wiesel. But Danny, you mentioned the Holocaust a number of times um, as well, and and at least on my screen, I'm seeing beneath you, Danny, my friend Ilsa Lang, who's uh, who, who's tuning in from New York, and I saw um, John behind you a little a little while ago. So it's it's first of all nice to see you, but but um, negligent of me also to, to miss another milestone in November, which John had his uh, number of times when I was living in the States, John shared his personal recollections of, uh, of Kristallnacht uh, also, also this month, not in a 30 year, um, uh, but, but certainly a, a piece. And when you spoke about, and not to diminish the Holocaust as a whole thing, but that is one of the, the milestones that's no less significant in all of this history of modern Israel. A lot to comment on, go. Well, first of all, you also have to realize that the, uh, you know, the Warsaw Ghetto was sealed in November. I mean, okay. November. I want I want to emphasize that with the way, um, you know, when we look at historical dates and we try to find coincidences between them, uh, November is right before the onset of winter. It's right after the Jewish holidays. There was a psycho psych There's a psychological element in history, I think, of this time period and the way that we all behave. Look at what happens Thanksgiving in America. You know, people are, it's like the much needed break. It's right before the dead of winter. There are reasons for that. I mean, we could look at the, the pattern of uh, significant months for historical events if we were to go into the Southern Hemisphere and see if there's something similar too. But there's definitely this, um, these waves that history goes through. You know, the Balfour Declaration was made public on November 2nd. It was put in a newspaper November 7th, but the first draft of it, and actually the real official draft that became the preface to the final draft was on what was uh, uh, in the end of June. So, it took six months to get to a final draft and make all of the all of the wheelings and dealings make happen. The so whole three paragraphs. A 67 word paragraph. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> a 67 word paragraph, at which originally, up until, if I'm not mistaken, it was three days beforehand, the most the most known draft still included the term state. Uh, but it was changed because of the in, the in, uh, the pushing of Edward Montague, of the Jewish member of the House of uh, uh, of the House of Lords, very much of Parliament, very much was an anti-Zionist. So again, we want to look also at what are the anti movements that are happening at this time, um, in each of those time periods of using this thirty year model. Um, so I think that there's, again, there's a, a similar patterns that we can see. I'm very, very, very careful of creating parallels, but how do we see that they, that leadership 
how long does leadership take to be influenced? How long does it take to create new leaders? Mm. I'm actually going to create, I recently published an article on um, the second Antif the connection between the second intifada and the shift in anti-Semitism around the world, which I believe both um, the shift in anti-Semitism led up to the second intifada and also followed it. How so? For those of you who don't know, the second intifada was kicked off in 2001. Um, uh, with a revival of bombings and su suicide bombings happening around the around the country. Uh, but one of the things that did take place as a result was their the narrative became of the uh, the dis uh, the dispossessed Arab by the Jew was suddenly so socially acceptable because oi, the poor, you were, this time it was you who were the victim of the Jew. In every 30 years, you will see that there is another upheaval of scapegoating of Jews for one reason or another. And like I said, it could be for political reasons. And in, in the United States right now, we're seeing a massive upheaval of some traditional tropes of Jew hatred that don't, they, they don't fit into the general definition of anti-Semitism. And the problem is, is that anti-Semitism changes its face and it changes its message. So what was once hating Jews for their Judaism became hating Jews for their culture and then hating Jews for their blood and then hating Jews because now they have a state and now hating Jews because they're strong. And don't you hate those damn Jews because they went from living in, in mud floored huts in you know in, in in the Carpathian Mountains, uh, and they were living in poverty, where a family of fifteen had to share one pair of shoes. And now you can't do anything without having to encounter the Jew. What was the most recent statistic? I think the AC, the AJC report, uh, or and, and all different reports. I hate these reports. I don't think they tell us anything. However, the numbers people are obsessed these days with numbers, right? Let's not even talk about the count going on in America. So the, <laughs> the numbers are that 69.5% of all hate crimes are against Jews, which is less than 1.3% of the Jew, of the world population. We yeah. are so small that we don't even we aren't even qualified to be included in university anthropology courses. When I was a university student, each time I was a university student, I made a stink of it. You, you know, you keep using you Jews as an example, but you won't actually study Jews. You won't study Jewish history, this massive history that has an influence on everyone, whatever your faith is, however you practice, whether you're Jewish or not. But that's something I do want to emphasize going back to bringing that full circle to the Balfour Declaration. It was the resistance of the Edward Montague, the Jew right. who was so desperate to be accepted in the society in which they lived as, no, 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 no. I'm not a Jew first. It didn't start under Obama with the use of the term Israel firster. It was something that we know from papers of Roosevelt. Roosevelt was not a Jew lover. Um, you know, we know from Ford. We know, uh, we know that these references of, are you a Jew first? I know you said we don't want to go even before the Dreyfus affair, but uh -huh. I can. And I can show you how there are these time periods of the Chobah Beit Zion, for example, the lovers of Zion, Zion movements, which were religious Jews living in Eastern Europe, not Germany, where the, 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 you know, the cosmopolitan Jew was. And they didn't call it Zionism. It was Zionos. It was in Yiddish, the love of Zion, because we've had that love for Zion for, for 3,000 years. The only difference is Zion changed its face. Yeah. Nowadays, you have Jews who are anti-Israel because they say Israel changed its face, right? There's the famous song, I have no other land, even if my land is burning, even if it's changed its face. Well, now, I don't know if you know, but it's been used more and more recently by the um, anti-BB movements. Uh, and I, again, as I've emphasized in everything I do, leave your politics at the door. Some of you may be right wing, left wing. Oh, I don't care. Anti-Semitism is not a left or right wing issue. This is a human issue. It's not a Jewish issue. It is a human issue. And the waves that we go through can only be, they can't be eliminated, in my opinion. They can only be decreased. 
And each wave as it occurs has a greater potential to allow Jews to be the or la goyim, the light unto the nations that we are supposed to be. Not necessarily because of tikkun right. olam, we have to go worry about everybody else. No, I think that the 30 year phases and I can, there are 70 year phases as well that we can see 40 year phases after the Yitziat Mitzrayim, the coming out of Egypt, how many years were they in the desert? For 40 years. That's why Jonathan, I wanted to tell you, Redo your yeah. math. I think that you'd find it's actually more like a 38, 36, 38 year pattern. And I'm a huge lover of gematria. So, you know, when I see the double high, I'm like, yeah, there's a reason here because God's hand is in everything. That's oh, it. I love it. So, so, you know, this is amazing. Okay. So there's, there's a lot, this is way more to <laughs> unpack more than I, that. than I, <laughs> I know, and we're and we're not going to get to it all today. So maybe we'll have a December version, or, or so. I don't know what milestones there are, uh, but I do. So, so I have lots of I'm questions. Happy I know to everyone share with watching. You with milestones, don't forget. Okay, okay, okay. My don't birthday. Don't forget that um, Alan be crossed on the first candle. Okay, Alan be crossed into oh. the land of Israel, and the stamp that was issued. It was a joint stamp issued by the British, both here in 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 the land of Israel, remembering that everything said Palestine E I Palestine yeah. as Israel, meaning they never disconnected. Right. Okay, right. so what was it? They issued a stamp of Allenby coming across, and it shows Allenby and Herzl, and in behind them is the picture of Balfour's face, the etching mm. of Balfour's face, because you can't separate all the historical events one from the other completely. Right. Okay, so be beautiful. Thank you. There, there there's un I, I, I could we could go on for days, and we and 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 we're not. But but um, I, I want to just underscore that there because this is such a wide ranging conversation. I want to underscore for people to please put questions that they have in the chat. I know we're live on Facebook now. And if there are questions there, we'll try and get them back. And, and also the song you just alluded to, Alana, I want to post that uh, in, in, the, in the chat on Facebook so people can see. Um, you both individually uh, spoke in, in, from, from different perspectives, the, the, the foundation of faith. Right in in, in 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 the Jewish people's return and, and in um, and, and the biblical foundation. Right, this is rooted. This is not an, simply an historic event that you might learn about in a in a university setting, but there's that there's a, a biblical uh, context as well. Um, so, un, returning to the fact that Genesis one two three foundation is building bridges between Jews and Christians. And there are a lot of Christians who about probably fifty fifty. Uh, right now, who are who I can tell who are who are watching live, um, we've discussed um, specifically Balfour, that he was uh, a, a, a faithful Christian, and and uh, I don't know if it's fair to say that he was a Zionist per se. Although you're welcome to comment, but what I'd like to know, talk about Balfour and his faith. Talk about, but I, but but we now realizing, in in however many years that the parallel realization of our dream to return is also a parallel awakening of a Christian understanding that God, that God's hand is in everything like you just said, Alana, and that our restoration here is significant. And we've seen cer pre-state, certainly since 1948, when, when we declared independence and in, and We'll, you, we'll stick with the 30 years or maybe 40 years, but in the last 30 or 40 years, um, we've seen a tremendous rise of Christian Zionism. What are your yeah. thoughts on, respectively, thoughts on the Christian Zionism? What's your experience? Um, where does that fit in? Not, not to November specifically, but to this big picture that, that we're, I don't know if we're, we're, we're drawing or, we're, or if we're dissecting. Yelena, you want to start? <laughs> You go ahead. <laughs> um, I, when we talk about Judeo-Christian, it's clear that there is a connection. Um, well, obviously, Jesus was Jewish. It started here. Um, when people ask me, how do you feel about it? I say, look, you know, they, I believe there will be a Messiah, Jewish Messiah. They believe Jesus is the Messiah. Let's wait till the Messiah comes and we'll ask him if he's... Uh, Either way, from my perspective, if it is Jesus, he's Jewish as far as he's concerned. So uh, we can't lose either way, uh, those of us who live here. 
Um, but being a bit more serious about it, dealing with the realities of it, um, it was said and prophesied, and, and, and a devout Christian knows this, that the word of God will emanate from, uh, from Jerusalem. And uh, this is not only, and the Judaism also believes it's not only for the Jewish people, but for all people. And the, the word is wonderful. If you look at it, um, the, the, the concepts and the basic concepts of Judaism um, work for everybody. And I'm not talking about the religious aesthetics that, that Jews have to abide by. I'm talking about the attitudes to, towards life, towards living. Um, a lot of the concepts uh, that, that are called progressive today are basically, they find their roots in, in, in Judaism. And um, a lot of people like to talk about the tikkun olam in, in a very warped, uh, in a very totally misunderstanding what the concept means in Judaism. But if I'm going to take it to that, what Judaism had, had done, by the way, about 2,000 years ago, and it done in uh, um, at around the time of the existence of the temple, this was very much a center of, of for people at that time to come here and see it and were allowed to a certain level of uh, uh, access uh, to, to see and take part in what was going on. And they were welcome to do so under the Jewish religion because it was believed that the word of God is not only for the Jews, the Jews are the ones who are bearing it and carrying it to the rest of the world and the redemption will happen to humanity through the Jewish people and through God and God's word, which will create that is going that if my understanding of all this is correct, because I'm not, I'm not religious. Um, I'm, I'm Jewish by faith and I'm Jewish by my, uh, my identity. Um, so a lot of this does, and a lot of Christians do see that and do understand that. Um, when I speak about Christianity, it's different than a lot of other Israelis, because for me, it's family. My father converted to Judaism. Um, so half of my family or my father's part of the family are all Christian. And um, we've been able to find that respect. And, and you know, I celebrated their holidays. They celebrated our holidays. And we totally respect each other. So for me, it's, it's, it's natural, that bond between Jews and Christians. So I, I have no difficulty with that and have no um, problem with that happening and having Christians see that and support the state of Israel. Many Israelis and many Jews have one problem with, I think some Christians do not understand with is the attempt to convert Jews or to get Jews uh, to, to, you know, they wanna save us. It's a nice concept, um, but we don't need saving. You have your belief, stick to it. We don't try to convert anybody. We're welcome to, to have you come here and even live in the state of Israel but please respect us. While we're living in the diaspora, when I lived in the South of the United States during the 60s, and um, I was given books by my teacher to come home with that were uh, Baptist uh, books, and my mother would look at it, she was Israeli, she would laugh, put it aside, call up the teacher and say, thank you very much. You know, uh, I know it's coming from a good place, but uh, we're, we're not interested. Um, it's, a, it's a total lack of disrespect for us, especially if you come here and try to convert us. Don't do that. Don't do that. We don't need that. If, uh, if Jesus is the Messiah and he comes back someday, I'm sure that we'll understand and we'll learn and we'll, we'll change it. We don't need you to do that to us. And I stress this in a very polite way because um, a lot of Israelis don't take that very politely and do not respect that and are very suspicious of the good Christians who are trying to be partners and, and share with us and, and, and help us out because they always see that element of it. Uh, so when, because we all went through it. When we lived in the diaspora, we heard these stories and there was the forceful attempt to get us to convert. So I'm stressing this in a way that if you wanna be part and, and supportive of the state of Israel, you have to respect our Jewish identity and the fact that we, we ourselves are very uh, secure in that belief and very supportive of it. Zionism was the return of the Jewish people to the land of Israel. That's what it means. So if you wanna be a Christian Zionist, you should be there to support us in the way we want to develop our country. Um, beyond that, I think there is a place because Western society is built on the Judeo-Christian values and uh, the way for, for society to, to, to save itself. And I did see one of the questions here was raised, how do, I, how do we feel about the elections and if there may be a change in the United States, if I may be allowed to, to jump into that for a moment. Um, I personally am concerned because I think that this current administration saw and understood the benefit of Israel to the United States saw and understood the benefit of Jewish-Arab relations to the United States and to American interests. 
Um, they changed the paradigm which existed for the past 30 and past 70 years of uh, that we don't have to be Jewish concessions. We don't have to, uh, to, to give in to Arab demands, but there has to be a peace based on equality and understanding that the Jews are here and the Arabs have to accept that. And if there will or will not be a Palestinian state, it will not come at the extent and expense of the state of Israel. So going back to the old paradigms is going to be very dangerous. And I'm very concerned that we may be again, we may be in a repeat of the 1930s right now, the period just before the Holocaust. And if we're not aware of that, because there are these forces that claim to be forces of, of uh, progressive forces, um, Marxism, progressivism is dangerous to the Western society and they're anti-religious at the core. And with all due respect, and I'm saying this as not a religious person, the religious values that we grew up in, we grew up with, have created a society here that has been the most advanced and the most tolerant in the history of humankind. And if we lose that now, we're not gonna be any different now than the world was in the 1930s. Well, I appreciate you bringing in the 30s uh, as a 30-year. As um, Alana, what, what's your thought in terms of uh, Balfour as a Christian Zionist and the, the, um, the, the growth, the flourishing of Christian Zionism? So again, being forced by my own nature to look at those patterns and how it led up to it, the majority of stories we have of the Holy Land happened, uh, have been transmitted primarily through Christian visitors to the Holy Land over, you know, in the 1500s, 1600s, you have Mark Twain who comes here in 1700s, you have all these different, different uh, Christians who come through. And again, we see this happen in a pattern of when is, uh, you know, what's happening in the political climate around it in the country, in the governments that are, gov kingdoms that are in power. Um, uh, it's, it's described as a desolate wasteland. It's, you know, there's no people anywhere. Um, and the Balfour comes at a time when there is an upheaval also in this, uh, what does religion and what does faith mean for us in our societies? In order to do that, you have to assess how do Christians and Jews relate to each other? They go hand in hand. Um, the Jews had always been kept separate for generation after generation um, and kept as, uh, you know, in the Arab countries, dimmi status and in the non-Arab countries called various different things with the Jew badge that was put on them. In very early times, the term ghetto today, is, you can't even say it without what has happened to the term. It's like people throw around the word Nazi, like it doesn't mean anything, but it does. It has a very particular meaning. That's why, and Dan, Danny, you know how much I respect you, but I won't look at what's happening now as a pre-19, as around, you know, compared to the 1930s, pre-Holocaust. No, if anything, it's the 1920s. It's the combination of the flapper society and everybody trying to have a whole bunch of fun. And in the background, there's murmurs, but this, they become socially acceptable. It becomes socially acceptable to hate Jews. And that's why in the 1930s, it becomes the legal campaign, which is Hitler wrote as early as 1919. As early as 1919, he writes that there is an emo, you know, emotional anti-Semitism will get us nowhere. It will only produce itself in terms of riots and pogroms that achieve very little. This isn't verbatim. I could go verbatim, but I won't bother. Uh, and then he writes, but rational anti-Semitism will accomplish a legal systematic campaign for the elimination of the Jew. The term that he uses, by the way, elimination, also can be interpreted from the original German as extermination the same way as you call an exterminator to come and eliminate the bugs from your house. So this was in 1919. And of course there's eternal debates as to whether or not Hitler intended to kill the Jews or didn't intend to kill the Jews. And that's a whole other discussion I'm happy to have another time. But the key here is how did you reach a point where all of the society is willing to say, oh yeah, you can depict a Jew that way on the, on the front of the major newspaper in this country or that or in this society or that, or now as we can say in a modern day on this website or that website, 
I mean, you have major newspapers putting out blatantly anti-Semitic images. And we have massive amounts of Christian Zionists all over the world. So let me connect now to the question of the Christian Zionist that, that Balfour was. What is Christian Zionism in each of these generations mm. also changes shape and it changes face. On one hand, it's a Zionism that believes the Jews must return to the land of Israel in order to bring about what we want, which is the return of Jesus or and the redemption of, of his return. Or it's I, I as a Christian, as a good Christian, recognize the Jew and the Jewish rights that they have as human beings and for their own practice of their own faith. And therefore I will support it because it is the just and moral thing to do. If you ask righteous among the nations who saved Jews and there we're talking again about less than 2% of the, of the European population who attempted to save Jews, less than 2% of the European population who made any effort to save Jews. And of course, who that we know of, we also have undocumented cases. We also have undocumented cases of people who turned in Jews because they needed sugar for their family or a loaf of bread. So I, I'm not going to make that kind of competitive comparison. What I'm trying to highlight is there are the people who saved Jews who said, I didn't do it because I was a Christian. I did it because I'm a human being and so is the Jew. Christian Zionism over history changes its face in that way as well. And today, the reason that, as Danny mentioned, so many people are resistant against evangelical or other forms of Christian Zionism, it's because there seems to be this ulterior motive. Interestingly enough, it goes along with the shift of Christian theology and its acceptance of Judaism and Jews. The time when the Pope finally declared that Jews you know, are not this heathen heretic who that we are given legitimacy to have our own faith and our own, that was a major milestone and was followed by the way, by a major upheaval of Christian Zionism. That was around, you're talking about the late, um, after the massive rise of anti-Semitism in Europe in the 1960s, you know, after the 67 war, suddenly you have this whole time period between 67 and 73 and these two wars where you're, that you're seeing also a shift in the Christian attitude towards Jews and Jewish power. And I believe that Jewish power plays a very important role, not only in those other, those other waves I mentioned, but it also plays a role in how Jews are accepted by Christians and how it relates to Christian Zionism. Jewish power was not, and I don't mean Jews own Hollywood and Jews own all the banks, but it's the perception of power and the perception that Jews have some sort of major influence. And can that Jewish influence help us? People love to politicize the Balfour's Declaration. It's easily politicized because it was able to achieve for the British an agreement where they could get a significant amount of land with a significant amount of oil and it would benefit them in the long run. And oops, 30 years later, let's support the Arabs because they are the ones with power and the, that power struggle, we know what side we wanna be on. That power of the Jew shifts and the power, the, the perception of whether or not it benefits the world to, to support more a, a movement for more Jewish power, which is what people perceive Zionism to be. Um, it, you know, is that timely? So right now's Christian Zionism is also split in two from my personal experience. And I also say this, and Jonathan, you know, that not only is it because of political reasons that sometimes what your submissions don't get published, it's also because we are very careful. At Israel Forever, we have an, or an effort called the Virtual Citizen of Israel Initiative. And this is a program where we just want to recognize Jews around the world for their birthright. But of course, we welcome non-Jews as virtual citizens of Israel. Excellent. Why? And we have this very blatant on our website that we say, we welcome you because you who accept us, and this does echo Danny's sentiment, that those of you who accept us for an Israel that is based on Jewish values and Jewish ancestral rights, and that we have the right to exist as a Jewish state for the Jewish people, regardless of what happens with Jesus, because as the old joke says, when Jesus comes back, he's going to look for the first kosher restaurant. 
you know? So, and he's going to say, where's my, can somebody lend me to fill in? I mean, th these are the things that we want and more dialogue between Christians and Jews can achieve that. Right. Unfortunately, most of those interfaith dialogues are, are co-opted by political initiatives or by a desire to convert as Danny mentioned. And I think that the efforts, I know Jonathan, you worked very hard at this and you have even for many years, that the types of dialogues that are respectful of the Jew, and by the way, we need to see the same dialogue between the Arab and the Jew, not just the Christian and the Jew and the Muslim and the Jew, and not the same thing. Unfortunately, young people today cannot distinguish between what is an Arab and what is a Muslim. Right. There, the ignorance is killing us. So what I say to you and your audience is if you're the, as proud Christian Zionists, be vocal, be more vocal for Jewish rights because that is the only way and I don't believe that Balfour gave us rights to the Israel. He didn't give a gift us Israel, neither did the United Nations. But for some reason, even the Edward Montagues, the, the very progressive left-wing anti-Zionist Jews of If Not Now and, and the Jewish Voice for Peace, which is in anything but Jewish, those types of movements are suddenly, their eyes are open when they see Christians who get it more than they do. They get that Jewish rights are not something that need to be silenced. I was once asked by a colleague, by a friend of mine, you know, what's with you in the Jewish cause? Why can't you just give it up? Isn't there something else? You I said, you know, if I was a black woman, would you say that to me? Mm. If I, you know, would you tell me I needed something else that to fight for? No, we're only told that as Jews, it's our job to stand up for the other. Even though we have witnessed time and time again in history, how few will stand up for us. So when I, my personal approach to Christian Zionists and Christian Zionism in general is, I accept it as a version of being righteous among the nations, but only if that intention is truly righteous and therefore accepts God's gift of, of the Jews to the world, God's gift of the land to the Jews, God's gift of our ability to really come together and even remember the significance of the temple. For example, the United Nations once again declaring that the Temple Mount, which they don't refer to as the Temple Mount, has no connection to Judaism. But if a Christian is a Zionist, then therefore they must believe that there was once a temple, right. a great Beit HaMikdash. And the famous prayers that we have about the Beit HaMikdash and the history we have that come written in the Torah that it is for all people. That the, no one want, should have wanted the, the Beit HaMikdash destroyed because that was where all people could come and pray. And all people did come and pray and they came from all over the world to be there whether they were Jewish or not. That's my dream for Israel. My dream for Israel is that there are people all over the world who say, oh my God, there's a Jewish state. That's where I want to live. Beautiful. Love it. Well, that actually, that was an interesting conversation I had yesterday. Um, again, there's a tremendous amount to unpack. Uh, we, we could have multiple webinars on any uh, offshoot of these, uh, of these topics. I want, I want to ask one more question um, with, with engaging a little forethought before I invite um, uh, our good friend, Pastor Trey Graham, to come up and, and begin to conclude the program. Um, we've been speaking mostly tonight in terms of uh, history, um, history and milestones relating to the month of November, wildly digressing into all kinds of other great subjects, which is terrific. As good Jews do. That's well, but, but we can't. We knew this going into the conversation. It wasn't linear. There was no way to have just a straight, and, and it's good, and it's good. And, and, and a lot of, there are going to be a lot of questions on this, and that's terrific. So another milestone, at least this week, uh, I think we mentioned it before the program started, is that, um, I, I, I got to give some background, um, the, the end of the parole for Jonathan Pollard. Um, for those who don't know, Jonathan Pollard is an American Jew. Uh, he's actually got, been given Israeli citizenship as well. He was convicted of spying for Israel in the 1980s. He was a naval intelligence analyst. Um, he never said he wasn't a spy. He never denied it. He served 30 years in prison um, and was released five years ago uh, he, he was given a life sentence, in fact, um, which was 
which was and is disproportional for not only anyone who uh, was found guilty of a crime as he as he did, but also even more so uh, for people who were found guilty of, uh, of spying for uh, countries that were either not friends of the United States or in fact outright enemies. And there's a lot of sense of injustice um, in many different levels. I don't want to unpack Jonathan Pollard's trial and sentence and, and, and any of that, but, but if nothing changes as of this Saturday, his parole will end and, and that may allow him to finally realize his dream of coming back to Israel. Um, I, I don't wanna ask you to give up any intelligence or, or sources you have, but we've talked about the past. I'd like you to just speculate uh, what's gonna happen in the next two days, um, what might happen, um, who, who's having conversations with whom, and whether we might see Jonathan Pollard land at Ben Gurion Airport anytime in the near future. Lana, that was a shake of the head, no? <laughs> I don't, I personally don't think so. I just think that, um, you know, much like there was this uh, excitement build up to uh, the annexation of Judea and Samaria, I think that there's just too many, um, there are too many political dealings happening right now for a major move to be made, whether it is good or bad. And I'm a huge believer in the heartland and homeland of our homeland. Um, and, and, but there, I, I think that's also something that people forget, which is, uh, you know, especially if you have a candidate, you have a, a leader that you love or you hate, you're going to love or hate them no matter what. I always remind, you know, my audiences and students that you really would not have loved Ben Gurion the way that you think you would have because of the nostalgia we have for him, or or Golda Meir, or for that matter, Herzl. There are great leaders throughout history, and I could also, by the way, the history of Christian Zionists are so gorgeous. They're great characters who, by the way, they might also have been, as I know, very diehard anti-Semites. There's always a political play going on. There's always something going on in the background. I don't think that in the coming days or weeks that you're going to see anything change. Um, I just think that there's, if it were to happen, with all due respect to Pollard and to, you know, I really, with all, if it were to happen, I think it could create more bad than good because there are much more urgent issues that are less divisive on our plate right now that really need to be addressed. And I don't think that, that the Pollard matter is the only one that we need to be focusing on or to get newspapers focused on, frankly. Thank you. So Danny, before you chime in, just relating to our history, uh, in, in the foreign ministry. I started my job at the consul in Atlanta in December of 1987. And one of the first things that I was told, my name is Jonathan, but don't behave like Jonathan. Uh, what, what, what are your thoughts um, uh, as it relates to Jonathan Pollard and, and any comments? Well, these things I, I've always believed you have to, it's better to be quiet about it and let things work out in the background and not make an issue because the moment it becomes an issue, it becomes political. And, and I agree with Ilana that you don't want to make this more political than it has been. If he's lucky and if they're, they're quiet about it and it doesn't seem like some big thing that he's doing for Israel, he may be able and they may give him this ability after everything that he's done. Um, I was at the consulate in New York. He was operated um, through the consulate in New York, not through my department. Um, when this started, um, I had a good friend. Sorry, Benny, I'm on a call still. Hello? Go ahead. So I worked at the consulate. A good friend of mine, she just upped and left that night and came back to Israel. Um, that's how we learned about it. So mm -hmm. um, it's not something we're proud about. I can just say this. Uh, years later, as the director of the government press office, uh, I had an incident with one of the leading journalists here from an American organization. And um, his behavior after he had finished his term here, um, he, he was picked, he was stopped by the police. And when they described what he was doing, I, I was very suspicious about it. And it sounded very strange. And when I went to the state, I had, I had thought that he was doing things for the uh, Russian, uh, for the Russians. Uh, very long story short, I came to the States and I gave this information to a friend of mine um, who had connections with the uh, FBI. And he came back, he said, no, 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 he's not Russian, he's, he's one of ours. <laughs> and I came back to Israel and I told this to the Shin Bet, who I, at the time, I, I told them about my concerns about him, that I thought that he was a spy. And they said, no, no, it's not, it's not. 
ends up they knew who he was working for, the Israeli Shin Bet. They didn't want me to follow up on it. And when I did, and I came back to them, I had the deputy head of the Shin Bet call me up and chastise me and said, what are you doing? I said, listen, I'm, I was doing this and, and, and I was trying to find out because I thought he was, you know, he's working for an American organization, he's Russian, and I'm American. He goes, it's even worse. <laughs> You should not, you want to get picked up now. You want to get arrested. And I said, no, I was, so you have to be very careful in this world. Uh, there's no room for the innocent in this place. You know, being very naive and innocent. And at my age, being naive is not something honorable. Um, so anyway, I was luckily that I didn't step into something at that point, but it just goes to show you how the feelings were here. And when I finally asked him, I said, you know, if you know this guy was spying, if it, he said, look, the United States is the United States. Israel is Israel. We don't do, we don't even leave an impression that we're in doing, you know, that even mistakenly that somebody would think that we're spying on the United States now. We know they spy on us. It's fine. They're a superpower. We're little Israel. We don't forget who we are. And let's remember the difference. You know, we're friends and everything, but they're still the United States. So that's the attitude here in Israel about that. And that's, uh, so I'm hoping for Jonathan's sake that they get off of his case already. A lot of it had because it was friends and allies who spied, and because we, we cheated the United States in this, which is totally unacceptable. But for his personal, he's paid a price, a tremendous price. I hope that he's able to get it over with and turn on the leaf and come here to Israel. And I hope it doesn't become another political issue because it, it's, he's, he's paid enough. Of it. And it comes down to it that it's a personal issue. It's his personal. You know, Israel won't change. The United States won't change if he comes or he doesn't. It, it, it doesn't bear, it has no bearing on any of us anymore. It's just on him. So I think the, 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 the less, of course, politicians are going to make a big issue out of it and show here also. Uh, I'd rather they didn't. But yeah. that's politics. Well, that also depends on how close we are to elections uh, here in this country. True. So that this has been awesome. I'm going to invite uh, Pastor Trey Graham to come on. Uh, Trey is joining us from Melissa, Texas, where he is the pastor at the First Melissa Church. Um, he is incredibly well versed in modern Israeli history and Jewish, uh, Jewish Judaism and Jewish teachings, um, really at the forefront of a lot of the things that we're talking about in terms of uh, Christian Zionism. And, and, and sometimes if you don't know that he's Christian, you will actually think he's Jewish because of the breadth of his knowledge and commitment. And, and on that level, uh, we, we, we should add that everyone should should follow that trem tremendous example that you said and you do because a lot of people do emulate that tray and that's really incredible. Um, we also have the privilege of having you serve as a member of the advisory board of the Genesis 123 Foundation. And it's really a pleasure to invite you to, uh, to join us tonight. Um, you've probably had your head spinning in many different directions on things you'd like to um, comment on and what have you, but specifically, we're going to uh, let you loose with uh, an opportunity to um, lead us in prayer, but also uh, also an offering for Genesis 1, 2, 3. Well, Shalom from one of those Christian Zionists of whom you speak. It is an honor to visit with you, Jonathan, you're my good friend. You've done very important work here. You've brought on two very, very bright people. I want their uh, your guest to know that I've gotten an education tonight. It's, it's only daytime here in Texas, but it's got, <laughs> I've gotten an education here. So thank you both very much. For all, all the folks who are watching or listening, Genesis 123 Foundation does a lot of important work in this topic. Jonathan mentioned in the introduction, he is all over the map. He's religious and he's political and he's diplomatic and he's a sports fan and all over the place. And so there's lots of projects that this organization does. And if you are choosing to give donations, you might visit that website that you see on the screen, genesis123.co. There are different projects you can give to your charity or Zedekiah is the right way to share what your uh, finances are doing to put it toward projects that you believe in. So that is the website on the screen and there's a donate tab right on the website and I think it's worthy of your time. And Jonathan, if you are 
ready? I'd love to say a prayer. Please, please do. Our Father, we bow before you because you are the king of all kings. You are Adonai Echad. And we say thank you for this time, the time to visit, the time to learn. We pray Sha'alu Shalom Yerushalayim. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem, the peace of your people in your land. We pray as Americans that our nation will stand for truth, stand for honesty in the international world, in diplomacy, that America will stand with her friend Israel and that Israel will know that her friend America stands with her. Thank you for the truth of your scriptures. Thank you that you are the same God yesterday, today, and forever. And so as these very learned guests have talked about patterns over the years, they're very educational and enlightening, but they're not surprising because you are the same God. So protect your people, raise up leaders of both nations who seek after truth and wisdom and courage and boldness, all so that your divine will may be done. Hallelujah and amen. Man, thank you, Trey. Um, it's a pleasure, pleasure, um, and 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 for encapsulating so much of what you heard today. Uh, just another couple of minutes. We're going to wrap up. Um, I, I want to share. We don't yet have our next uh, webinar scheduled, but in December we're going to have two or three uh, really exciting ones. Um, and so stay tuned for that. But um, Virginia, if we could see the next uh, slide, we are continuing with something that we launched last month um, with a unbelievably uh, groundbreaking grassroots global prayer for Israel over last month. It was over 12 hours uh, beginning in China, ending in Alaska with Christians praying for Israel in several different languages and uh, so something unbelievable. And uh, next month, we're going to be doing the Hanukkah prayer for Israel, celebrating the miracles. And these are some of the miracles there you see on the screen for which Christians around the world are going to be praying. Um, anyone watching this, please be in touch to join us. And uh, last thing I, I neglected to mention at the outset, uh, Trey, when I introduced you, um, that last time you, you and I saw each other in person here in Israel, um, in the last time we saw each other in person, and it happened to be in Israel, was, was this pandemic unfolding and, and, and everything was getting shut down. And, and at that cafe on Emek Rafaim Street, we kind of gave birth to the uh, Verses for Zion program, which again is one of the unique projects that we do um, Christian children with Israel through studying biblical verses that relate to the land of Israel. And so anyone who's interested in that information for them, for their children, for their grandchildren, uh, for their neighbor's children, um, please visit uh, versesforzion.com or, or we have information on genesis123.co. Um, ladies and gentlemen and friends uh, who've been joining, joined us from all over, um, the world tonight. Thank you for joining us. I hope it's been meaningful and inspiring. I hope you'll come back and join us again. Uh, Ilana and Danny, um, more, more than unbelievable. I wish that I had a single topic that we could have focused on because you've just sort of <laughs> opened so many more doors that we can, we, we can and we will have to go down uh, in the future. Um, thank you for, for taking your time tonight. It's been really a Thanks pleasure. for having us. Thank you, and thank all of your participants here. Uh, in the name of my children, we're very grateful for your support of the State of Israel. Awesome. Great. We all are. Thank you. Um, everyone have a great rest of your day, wherever you are. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom.